It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hugh Montgomery, who's a consultant in North London, professor of intensive care at University College London, one of my alma maters, uh, where he directs the Center for Health and Human Performance. He also is a noted author of thriller fiction and an amateur rocket enthusiast. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Hugh Montgomery to the stage. Well, once again, I mean, that was just a most tremendous um, presentation. Thank you. I was very moved by it, um, and I should give up and do something important with my life. <laughs> um, I'd thank, thank the organizers for inviting me and for the opportunity to meet such extraordinary people as are in this room. And I'm going to canter you through um, quite a lot in quite a short space of time. What I've been asked to address is uh, the role of um, medicine, uh, the role of artificial intelligence in medicine. Uh, this is just my quick declaration of interest. Uh, I consult the deep mind, but everything I'm going to say today is actually uh, my own personal view. Now, why on earth should we work with artificial intelligence? That's the first big question. Why on earth do we need it in general medicine? And it's actually because, as a practicing doctor, I'm going to let you into a secret, we're really pretty rubbish at what we do. Firstly, we're faced with far too much to do. In Great Britain, the, number, the population has grown by only 8% in that decade. But the number of admissions we're facing with complex medical comorbidities has gone up by 56%. The number of doctors has not gone up by 56%. And this is a problem faced worldwide. The WHO already say we've got a massive world shortage of medical healthcare professionals, and that's only going to get worse. Secondly, as I say, faced with that tsunami, we're just not very good at what we do. Firstly, if you just look at our ability to make diagnoses, this was a simple study done, uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, giving some interns a relatively straightforward problem and a slightly trickier one. And you can see here how well they think they did. On the easy cases, they were pretty certain they were right 72% of the time. In the tricky cases, they were pretty certain they were right 64% of the time. In reality, it was 55%, and it was a little under 6%. The problem is, in most cases, there's no ground truth unless you do the post-mortem. So we can convince ourselves we're right, we look for the evidence to support what we thought we'd, that we made the right decision, and we're often wrong. When you look at the post-mortems, we're very regularly wrong. And we're very regularly wrong in ways that would have changed the management of that patient. Why do we get it wrong? Well, sometimes we're ignorant. We just don't know. Sometimes it's a very rare case. I saw a case a couple of weeks ago, the first I'd seen in 32 years. Tricky to diagnose. Sometimes symptoms are shared, so flu can be hard to tell from meningococcal meningitis. We seek evidence to support the decision we'd already made. And we're fallible. We're humans. When we get stressed, we've had an argument or we're tired, our judgments are affected by that. We also don't quite know the, the truth about the tests we're doing. So I'm sure everyone in this audience has been gone to a doctor, maybe had a blood test, and told, don't worry, your test normal. Let me tell you right now, the doctor has no idea if your test is normal. <laughs> what they're telling you is that the test lies within a statistical normal distribution. That's not the same thing. So here's a creatinine. There's an extra naught on there. It should be 120. Across a population ranges in Britain between 60 and 120. You come to me, your result's 74. I say, it's normal. Your personal creatinine changes over a range of 12 in your lifetime. So it could be there. And a change of four in either direction for you is very abnormal, but I have no idea where you started. You could be anywhere along here. Anywhere at all. I can't tell you. We're swamped with data. 56% more patients in the last 10 years of my medical career, each one having more and more tests. I'm swamped with blood reports, I'm swamped with chest x-rays, MRI, CT scans, PET scans, lung function tests. And I'm somehow meant to assimilate all of those data. And I'm meant to compute them because it's not just the one test that I don't know if it's abnormal. I'm meant to match them up. So here's a simple example. I need to compute the ratio between two things, urea and creatinine, as an index of whether you're a bit dehydrated, because that's actually bad for you, unsurprisingly. 
That relationship is non-linear. So this is a heat map where black is where you're certain to die, and light blue is where you're certain to live. And if I look on the x-axis at the first test and the y-axis, the change, it's a non-linear test. But I'm meant to somehow carry that heat map in my head to inform how I manage you. If we then look at a later blood test and relationship to age, it's a different heat map again. We might put that into a 4D graph, and I'm meant to try and somehow plot you as a patient on that graph. And guess what? I can't do it. If you come to my emergency department, you will get full blood count, what's known as use knees, LFTs, and your clotting done. And that's the same, I guess, here, and I guess the same in the States. I'm doing that computation across 30 variables in every combination. At least I'm meant to be doing that. That's the number of computations I'm meant to be performing when I look at those blood tests. That number there is the same number as stars in three of our solar systems, or of our, mil of our galaxies, rather. And again, to reiterate, I don't even know what normal is to start with. We're also being asked to do things we're not designed to do. You and I, as members of the human species, are wired for faces. We're meant to be able to look at those two people on that side of the screen and recognise that although they're identical twins, we can see that they're different. And all of you can. All of you can spot them and go, they're not quite the same. We're wired for recognising people. We're wired for recognising emotion. Is that person a likely mate? Are they going to hit me in the face? Um, what am I... Or both. <laughs> Let me go over there. Um, we're really good at that. We are not good at anomaly detection. So here we are. It, this may or may not show up terribly well. It, I know what I'm looking for here. But this was a scan presented to 48 radiologists. And these 48 radiologists were asked to look for abnormalities on the scan. What they failed to spot was the gorilla, which is up there. Now, again, on an X-ray screen, you'd see it very much more clearly than that but they weren't looking for that anomaly. So none of them saw it, or at least very few of them saw it. We're not wired for anomaly detection, but we're being asked to do it all day long. What that means is that in clinical radiology, we make mistakes. Um, my own sister's breast cancer was missed on a mammogram, and it had been there, it was missed. That's not because the doctor was incompetent or stupid or lazy. It was because they're not good at finding anomalies. The same applies in clinical pathology. Looking at slides is boring and tedious. The subtleties are there are readily missed. We're not wired to look for them. What you need is an expert system. So as an example, here is such an, an intelligent expert system in anomaly detection. It's called a pigeon. Pigeons are really good at spotting breadcrumb, something edible lying around on a table. In this case, what uh, Rich Levinson did was to take a bunch of pigeons, and he showed them slides of breast cancer, or not, or mammograms with breast cancer, or not. And he got them to peck the touch screen. And if they got it right, they got a 45 gram pellet of food. And it took little over a week before the flock of nine pigeons was doing better than humans were. <laughs> Which, um, I hope that doesn't do too many people out of a job as you get a flock of pigeons in your radiology department. But they defeat humans. The point being, if you train a system to do what it's really meant to be good at, it will defeat humans. Thank heavens. We know that even 12 years ago, the very primitive forms of machine learning in Google could get the diagnosis of quite complicated medical cases from the New England Journal of Medicine right over half the time. Um, that case I was talking about earlier on, the case, the very rare case that I'd only seen one of before in my entire medical career, it took me 12 hours to get it. I was really proud of myself. But just for what fun, I went and put the symptoms and signs and the diagnostic tests into Google, and it filled the first three pages with that correct diagnosis. I perhaps shouldn't have bothered to go to work that morning, just stayed at home. And we are moving at a pace of knots. We are moving beyond exponentially for reasons... Uh, that we're all familiar with. Um, it's not just the processing power, the GPUs that have appeared, the drive of really bright brains into software development, but that led to AlphaGo beating the world Go champion in 2016. 2017, that same program, 
having never seen a chess game before, could beat the world champion in four hours, teaching itself. This is a speed at which we're changing in AI and medicine. And I'm going to stop with you with a short list of potential applications, because actually I'd rather this was a discussion rather than a monologue. The applications go far beyond just digital diagnosis of breast cancers or looking at histopathology slides. We're going to be able to apply this sort of AI to public health and to global health, to track and predict epidemics, to find out the social determinants of health, how we can improve housing and diets and interaction to improve health across nations. It's going to revolutionise drug development. So one particular company, for instance, during the Ebola outbreak, was able to screen compounds and identify two that were effective in treating Ebola, and they were able to do that in less than 12 hours. Less than 12 hours using AI. We're going to use genetic prediction. Six billion letters is too complicated for the human mind to interrogate, but Steve Tzu's group, amongst others, have been able to apply ML and AI processes, and they can now build your face from those letters. And they can get pretty close to your height and so forth as well. It's going to change screening. As a middle-aged male, at some point, someone is meant to stick a large pipe up my bottom end to screen me for polyps. Now, I'd rather that wasn't done, preferably. Um, Fortunately, every time you wee, there are 37,500 small peptide molecules in that urine sample. And great progress is being made in applications of, a, of machine learning and AI to identify diseases, even from peeing in a pot. So we're going to diagnose things. I think we're going to change the diagnoses. We're going to find the things I thought were one thing are actually three different things. We're going to predict events. We're going to be able to tell our patients with smoking-related lung disease a week early that they need to get in early with their antibiotics and so forth. And we're already getting a little bit better at predicting outcome, whether people can go to it will end up on my intensive care unit. Uh, if they're heading that way, maybe I could intervene early to stop them getting there. We've got machine interfaces. Uh, people will be able to think to control robotic arms, and indeed robots that can do surgery. We should remember, of course, the application of cybersecurity, as we may discuss. Your health data, I'm guessing, are probably much, much more important to you than some other personal data that, say, Amazon might hold about you. I suspect that you view your personal health data as being a little bit more private. And finally, there are bits to do with psychology, and I'm not going to touch on that because our next speaker will as well. Finally, one issue of practicality, one of ethics. The practicality is that it's hard to find people, other than Lily yesterday, who understand AI and understand medicine. We need a lot more of those people. The data sources are a problem. Who owns those data sources? Wouldn't it be lovely if we could share the British data with China and with you here? But there are issues of national sovereignty. There are issues of which company or which healthcare system owns them. And there are the questions of who owns them. Are they your data? Or are they mine if I'm your healthcare provider? The data themselves are sometimes opaque. If we look at this length of stay as it is here, you might want to get an algorithm to predict that. I don't think you'll be able to do it very well, because I know in medicine that there are too many social variables that will inter inter intervene to affect that. The data quality need to be checked, the validity, what is the ground truth, is important, and in what context they occur. Is a community acquired pneumonia in a labeled data set in a gym bunny, some young fit person like you in the audience who trains in the gym and who just gets pneumococcus? Or are we talking about someone with cerebral palsy, a disabled child who's aspirated? Both might be labeled as community acquired pneumonia. And there are some dangerous issues which I call circular feedback which perhaps we'll leave for discussion um, when Noah comes to the stage. And lastly, there are those ethical issues. Who owns the data? Who do we trust? Trust being an essential part here. Who gets access to the data and when? To give you one quick example of that, if you were to break your leg now, you might say, well, I'm quite happy for that to be my health record because I'm having treatment. Or you might say, it's irrelevant. I don't want Hugh to be able to see that. Three weeks' time, though, when you drop dead in the street, it might be really helpful for me to know about your broken leg because I would then make an immediate likely diagnosis of a pulmonary embolus. In a year's time, it becomes irrelevant again. So who makes the decision about what's important to be available and when? 
There will be dangers if AI gets better at predicting long-term outcomes. Because if it does get better at predicting long-term outcomes, we may be able to refine the insurance industry. And if we do that, that might disenfranchise a group of, of people, who, many of whom may be poor because there are strong social determinants of health. And that may itself drive inequity. So I think that was my last slide. Um, I'm very grateful for you to listen, for listening, and I'm very happy to engage in a conversation with Noah and with you as well. Thank you very much. Fantastic, please. Yes, what a fantastic presentation. I think this is just such an extraordinary example. For example, uh, Professor Jan LeCun this morning was talking about the challenges of generalized AI, but you've right. provided some lovely examples of very narrow AI, which can have a huge impact. Yes. Um, I just want to ask you the same question I've been asking some of the other panelists. That's this question of the moonshot. Right. If you could define one moonshot that you'd want 1% or 2% of your GDP devoted to when it comes to AI and medicine, what would that be for you? It's a very good question. It's an exceedingly good question if I could define one moonshot. <laughs> I mean, I think there are some generalizable issues. I mean, you think mm -hmm. the prediction side of things, I think Jan is absolutely correct about. Until mm -hmm. we've got systems that can predict better and learn to know what comes next, what we're really dealing with is just very much more sophisticated data analysis, really, in mm -hmm. determining you know, mass crunching of data. So I think that's going to be perhaps uh, the most important step. If you were looking at a narrow thing that makes the difference, mm -hmm. Um, we don't have long. Every Western healthcare system is about to collapse. 56% mm. um, more patients. In Britain, here's the scary data, 72% mm. of a junior doctor's time is now spent at a computer ordering tests or getting results back. These are the smartest people on the planet, doctors around the world, and they're leaving in droves. 42% of junior doctors left medicine in Britain last year. Why? because they're doing menial nonsense. Mm. If you can get AI to start taking over, determining what tests should be done, interrogating the results, and guiding those doctors, you liberate them. Mm. And you liberate them to do more of what's important, which is to spend time talking to you. Right. Um, bringing the humanity back into healthcare. It's rather a paradox, isn't it? That yes. computers will introduce more humanity, but I think that's what I'm looking for. My favorite expressions is, Humans for the best and robots for the rest. I think that very much applies in this case. I shall steal that, thank you. There you go for your next slides. Um, could you just, uh, before we open it to the floor, I'm also mm. curious how, you know, the WHO recently issued a report saying around four to 500 million people around the world don't have access to the most basic forms of medicine as and they don't even see a doctor at all. Right. What kind of potential might the automation and commodification of these skills enable for the developing world? That's a very good question, because to me, it's got two layers. Um, the first is, I think it's got enormous opportunity. I mean, mobile phones are indeed ubiquitous in Africa. Um, we know that. Uh, you can get retinal images, for instance. We heard about that yesterday from Lily. Yes. So, and the computational power of those does allow people not only to make diagnoses, but to communicate remotely with doctors as well. So I think that's the upside. Mm. The downside, which I think we all really have to be careful of, though, is that we just because we love the spangly end of medicine, that we don't forget the drivers of disease. And we heard that yesterday, 50% mm. of cancers are entirely preventable by lifestyle. Now, that for me is a legislative process. Mm. You can't victimize people, say, you're lazy, you don't take enough exercise, you eat rubbish food, you should change your diet. Governments need to legislate to make it easy for people to make the healthy choices. And that requires money and investment in infrastructure. If it all gets diverted to cure at the back end, mm. there won't be any money left to prevent the disease. So that's my slight concern in Western nations as yes. well as developing countries, that we don't wrap up the money in the techie iPhone stuff and forget about the primary public health issues. Sort of classic Silicon Valley solutionism.